Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Lambach, and I want to talk to you about space sustainability. Unfortunately, I can't be in Potsdam today, even though I would have really liked to, um, but I'm changing jobs right now. And uh, the, order, or the organizers uh, and I agreed that uh, this would be a suitable uh, substitute to record my lecture um, and present it to you this way because space sustainability is an important topic. It might not rank very high on the global agenda. We are all very busy and very concerned with all the things that are happening down here for a while or at the moment. Um, but space sustainability is a very important long-term uh, issue that I think deserves more attention. Uh, and this is one of what I want to talk about today. And the title um, of my talk is Pigs in Space. You may, uh, if you're a sort of my generation, uh, remember uh, these uh, three people. These are Dr. Julius Strange Pork, Captain Link Hawkthrob, and first mate Piggy on board the Starship Swine Trek. Um, and of course, uh, what I mean by that is uh, they are us. We are the pigs uh, in space because we're leaving trash everywhere. We are really. Uh, Umweltsäue, uh, like you would say in German, even though I know that this is unfair um, because um, I've been told that, that pigs are actually very, uh, very cleanly animals. Um, so this is in, in a way a very unfair comparison. Now I want to sort of put my cards on the table here right, right away. Um, what I want to argue is that space is an environment, much like we treat um, our terrestrial environments uh, on land, uh, the seas, the poles, the atmosphere. And we should, by treating it as an environment, uh, we should strive to apply principles of environmental protection uh, to it. Now, I know that this isn't working all that well down here on Earth either. We're not treating the environments down here with the sort of care and protection that they deserve and need. Um, but in space, I think it's even worse. Um, we're ignoring the issue entirely. And I think this will escalate into being a much bigger problem um, for us uh, and for our uh, orbital environment. Now, my first point would be to ask, why, why is that so? Why do we not treat space as an environment? So please ignore the typo. So if you look at what uh, UN bodies like the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space um, or the Office of Outer Space Affairs, um, what they talk about, mm, then sustainability is a pretty prominent um, buzzword there, but this is more often about resource use and access to access to space. But uh, it's very rarely framed in terms of environmental protection. And I have a few thoughts, not answers, uh, why we do not treat space as an environment. The first is that there is just very few people up there. Um, apart from the International Space Station, which has a kind of an uncertain future, uh, and even, even if we could keep it around for longer, it, it only holds a couple of, of astronauts at the same time usually. And there are just very, very few people in space. Um, and this sort of creates a, a difficulty for us to, to imagine space as, a, as an environment, because environment, uh, in the way we understand it, is, is uh, inevitably seen as an environment for humans. Now, that's not um, a total barrier to such an understanding, because the high seas, um, the deep seabed, Antarctica, all of these also have a very limited human presence and are also very in inhospitable. And we have managed to come around to seeing these as environments. So maybe this is not, not a, a, a total barrier uh, against a better understanding of space as environment. Maybe it's about, you know, distance and the, the, limited physical interaction uh, between space um, 
and the Earth's surface. Now, there's there's there are a few things going on there, but it's just something that is easy to relegate as being, you know, out there, up there, something that does not affect us. And this relates to the second point. We have problems of visualizing space. I will show you a picture in a moment that really, really heavily distorts how empty all this uh, this environment is. We really cannot grasp, uh, first of all, the vastness of space, and second, the emptiness uh, of space. So space is a very strange environment. It's, it's very, very different from uh, the environments that we are used to, uh, and that we can, we have a hard time relating to that. Now, this is a bit short-sighted because, um, as any space agency will tell you, space is absolutely crucial for our way of life, um, or has become crucial for our way of life. Uh, many of them spend a lot of money in these kind of public outreach activities producing videos like a day without satellites that tell us that a day without satellites would actually be quite um, quite dramatic uh, for a globalized capitalist uh, humanity because our positioning systems our communication systems even systems of timing are very much dependent on constant synchronization via satellite and uh, we would see several uh, quite important systems uh, and critical infrastructures failing if, if, so, if our satellites were suddenly gone. But we don't have this kind of feeling of effectiveness. It's, it's too easy for us to see space as this great out there um, that has no bearing um, on our day-to-day -day life. Now, a third uh, point might be that we see sort of history repeating. Um, we tend to treat space as this sort of uh, emptiness, this, this empty space. And um, we can see, uh, we can sort of compare it in this way with other empty spaces uh, we've had in the past. Um, so uh, Antarctica and, and the Arctic or the deep seabed or in more imperial, imperialist times, uh, you know, large parts of Africa. Um, and other continents. And we sort of, there, there's a repeating pattern for how we, and in this case, I really mean us Westerners, how we interact with these uh, spaces. Um, there's this kind of frontier thinking, when, and frontier refers to this sort of Frederick Turner hypothesis of um, sort of a, an empty space that is gradually uh, uh, tamed and exploited and brought under control. Um, through the advance of the white man in this case. Now, what, what we see in these empty spaces um, as we progressively interact with them is um, resource exploitation, uh, um, growing human presence, and in the end, sort of an integration into uh, state systems or global systems of governance and control. Now, when I say uh, that this is happening, uh, I'm also offering sort of a cautionary tale because in all these other environments, um, such as the high seas, we always tend to notice that maybe we should have been a bit more cautious. Maybe we should have uh, applied the precautionary principle to environmental management. Um, because all of a sudden, uh, the environment isn't looking all that healthy anymore after a few decades of, of unbridled exploitation. And sometimes it's about not being able to assess the long-term impact of our activities. Think of microplastics uh, in the oceans. Maybe a decade or two ago, nobody was really thinking about that. And now that we sort of better understand the properties of this environment and, and the properties of the problem, we're suddenly noticing that we have pollution um, uh, polluted the oceans uh, uh, in a quite dangerous and innovative matter that also harms our own well-being. So these unknown unknowns are something we should be very cognizant of as we uh, approach space. We really don't know what the sort of the, the second order effects, the long-term effects of our activities there will be. And that should make us more cautious. 
And that's sort of the, the fourth point. I think we need a cultural sh shift. We need to understand space as environment to, to sort of move the consequences of our action uh, into the center of our attention. Now, I want to mainly talk about space debris today. So um, fragments uh, in orbits, but there are other sustainability issues that are also worth talking about, which I won't go into uh, in this particular talk, but uh, it's something to also keep in mind. First of all, it's about the sustainability of production. Space activities are growing at a tremendous rate at the moment. Uh, you can find these, these figures anywhere about sort of the size of the space economy, the number of rocket launches that are to be expected in the upcoming future. And all of this requires production um, using some quite exotic materials, um, some energy intensive processes. So there are um, uh, there are there are sustainability issues there. We have seen some improvement though, um, because some parts, including some very important parts like rocket bodies, um, are moving towards reusability. Um, SpaceX was really a, a trailblazer in this regard, creating a uh, uh, heavy lift uh, rockets that were able to be re to be reduced, whereas in the past everything was just single use. So there's that. But you know, with the with the growing number of of launches and the growing number of objects produced for space sustainability, uh, will become an, a more a more important issue. Secondly, we have launch emissions. So launching rockets emit um, hydrogen chlorides, uh, nitrogen oxide, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, aluminum oxides, water vapor, uh, and other uh, chemicals which do affect uh, the ozone layer. And there have been um, estimates that this does affect um, uh, climate change or climate uh, warming related uh, processes in the upper atmosphere. So there's there's something that it it does have an effect on on sort of the health of the atmosphere there. Now the impact or the size of the problem wasn't as problematic as long as the number of launches weren't that great. But we will see a larger number, a growing number of launches in the next few years, and that increases the impact. Um, to, to give you a, a, a sort of an alarming number, we now have about 10,000 or slightly above 10,000 working satellites in orbit. If we just look at the filings uh, with the International Telecommunications Union, which administers sort of radio wave uh, spectrums and broadband uh, and spectrums, um, about 1 million satellites are scheduled to be launched into orbit in, in the future. Now, these are just you know plans and filings, and it's unclear which proportion of these one million plus satellites will actually be launched. So even even if it's about ten percent, then we're still looking we are still looking at a six figure um, a number of satellites, which would be sort of a tenfold increase from what we have today. This does not imply a tenfold increase of launches, thankfully, because satellites are only getting smaller. Uh, we are moving from these these older, larger satellites towards swarms or constellations of smaller um, uh, satellites. So uh, the, the number of launches will grow, but at a slightly this slightly lower uh, uh, proportion than the number of satellites themselves. Now, uh, not a particularly happy outlook, but we are going to see more launch emissions. And finally, we have all, we also have emissions upon re-entry. So when uh, rocket bodies that were used during launch um, re-enter the atmosphere to burn up, or when old satellites are decommissioned and deorbited back into the atmosphere to burn up, um, they also produce emissions. And this is a field that hasn't been um, um, researched all that well because it's difficult to observe the, the exact process that happens during re-entry when these parts you know burn up very high in the atmosphere at temperatures of more than a thousand degrees um 
we do have the suspicion that this also affects the ozone layer and the health of the upper atmosphere. Um, but again, it's it's difficult to, to observe directly and uh, given present numbers of re-entering objects is probably not a huge problem, but you know, in the future, if we see more re-entering objects, this might become a problem. So again, with the unknown unknowns. Now we do have an environmental problem in space. This looks really dramatic, doesn't it? This is a still picture uh, from an ESA animation from 2019 of, of just debris objects. Um, all debris objects of at least one millimeter uh, length. And now uh, I, I would suggest uh, you also take a look at, at this, this uh, website, what's in dot space. It's maintained by the space command of the German armed forces, the Weltraumkommando. And I think that collects something like 25,000 or about 30,000 uh, objects in space that are specifically tracked. Now, I said we, ha we have very, hard time really visualizing uh, the problem. And, and this uh, picture is one way of dealing with that. And uh, because it's misleading for two reasons or distorting for two reasons. The first is that we don't actually know where smaller objects are. We can only really reliably track objects that are at least 10 centimeters long. Smaller objects, down to a millimeter um, can only be sort of estimated um, uh, through computer models. Um, for instance, if, if we look at the patterns of impacts on returning uh, spaceships or on recovered satellites, we can sort of estimate you know, how many uh, small scale impacts uh, did this particular spacecraft experience uh, in this particular orbit. And then we can sort of estimate you know, how many of these particles will likely be there. So for the vast majority of objects, we actually have no way of knowing where they are. Secondly, objects here are shown uh, in a great, at a, sort of at a great ratio of, 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 of magnitude. So uh, if these uh, uh, tiny dots were to scale, um, the, 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 the objects they represent would be sort of a kilometer long each, and that's that's just way off. Uh, in reality, sort of everything there would be empty. Uh, we would have to zoom in very, very, very far to observe even a single uh, piece of debris. Now, what this picture does show is that there are sort of different um, patterns in the debris. So we have this very dense layer, comparatively dense layer of debris right around the Earth. Then we have a large ring of debris uh, around the, the outskirts. And then there's also uh, sort of uh, in, in the middle between the two, there's also a slightly more dense constellation uh, of fragments. And that's that brings me to the three orbits uh, we are talking about. You might've heard about these in previous lectures. I will talk about them nonetheless. And we will start from sort of the outermost, which is uh, the geostationary or geosynchronous orbit, uh, which is about 36,000 kilometers above the Earth, Earth's surface. Uh, just for purposes of comparison, the moon is 384,000 kilometers away. So about 10 times that or 11 times that. So the advantage of, of placing satellites in geostationary orbit, or geo as it's called, is that they have a very large field of vision. They can sort of look at the entire half of the planet that's facing towards them. And even more importantly, they stay stationary relative to a particular point on the Earth's surface along the equator. So they can sort of continually observe the same place on Earth all the time. That's, that's hugely important for Earth observation and also for communications. The disadvantage is that you have longer sort of latencies for communications with these satellites, especially if the signal has to be relayed across the satellites. Um, so this is not something for high, high speed communications. And, and there are also limited slots available where you can emplace these satellites. And this is governed by the International Telecommunications Union, actually, they sort of started doing that uh, even from the, from the very early 
satellite era from the 60s and 70s. Um, so there are about 1,800 1, possible places for satellites to maintain a sufficient distance um, for, for safe operation. The next orbit is MEO, uh, medium Earth orbit, which is which covers basically everything between the other two. So, uh, so an altitude of 2,000 to 35,000 kilometers. This is a space that is sort of becoming more, that's co coming into use more, so mostly for communications satellites uh, and also for for positioning satellites especially in the uh, in the altitudes of about 19 to 23000 kilometers because it's semi synchronous um these satellites orbit the earth uh, in a 12 hour uh, time frame so they are very dependable and uh, positioning systems like gps galileo beidou glonass um, tend to operate in these altitudes and finally, we have LEO, low Earth orbit, um, which covers everything from about 400 to about 2,000 kilometers. And this is the region of space that is mo that we most use um, with our satellites. Um, the advantage there is that you have very low uh, um, uh, transmission latencies. So uh, uh, connections using satellites in LEO are much faster than those in GEO. It's also there also much easier to reach, require much less uh, fuel. And for, for satellite operators, um, uh, LEO is very interesting because it's completely unregulated. So uh, beyond you know registering things with the launching state and with the ITU, um, you can basically put your satellites where you want them. So um, uh, in contrast to GEO. Now, the thing is, Objects here move very fast. So we're looking at orbital speeds of about 28,000 kilometers per hour. That's about eight kilometers per second. Uh, and that's why um, debris fragments or collisions are so dangerous because these objects carry tremendous kinetic energy. In addition, LEO is also subject to um, what we might call orbital decay. So um, uh, the atmosphere sort of starts to frizzle out once we go above 50 kilometers and about 100 kilometers is sort of the official end of the atmosphere. But we do have sort of uh, the occasional molecule that strays a bit higher. So everything that um, that is flying at low enough altitudes, so a few hundred kilometers, is continuously slowed down um, by these, these uh, atmospheric molecules. Uh, and as the objects slow down, they start to move back to Earth uh, because they're captured by, by gravity. Um, they need to maintain orbital speed uh, to, to not get pulled closer to the Earth. And, and the closer you get to Earth, the stronger this, this slowing down effect is. Let's, let's take a closer look at LEO. This is a kind of a big, uh, big infographic here, and we're not going to cover all this in detail. What it shows is sort of the, um, the distribution of debris objects uh, at different altitudes from the Earth's surface to 2,000 kilometers. And there are um, three different uh, categories of, of things, the uh, the orange uh, uh, volume are those that are uh, currently tracked um, with a uh, with a size of, of 10 centimeters or more. It should be noted this is from 2019, uh, probably using old data. So we're now tracking a larger number these days, more like 30, 35,000. Um, then the light blue ones are those that are uh, a bit smaller, which are here called plant tracking, not exactly sure what this refers to. And then uh, another 400,000, at least one centimeter in size uh, that are not tracked. Uh, we can see that most of these, um, most of these debris fragments cluster at altitudes above 600 kilometers. So in the 600 to 1,200 kilometer band, uh, we see the largest number of uh, of objects. This is 
higher than the International Space Station um, and many other uh, many other space assets, but it's a very uh, busy region of space uh, nonetheless. And the reason for that is um, that these are objects that have accumulated there over time and have not been subject to, to orbital decay. Now here's a second graph um, from, a different, from a different paper that looks at um, natural decay time at different altitudes. Uh, and the way to read it is, uh, to, let's take the, the blue bar. So if you start an object at a uh, year zero at an altitude of 400 kilometers, uh, it will decay sort of within a year. Uh, moving to the, to the yellow bar, starting at an altitude of 450 kilometers, this will decay in about three years and burn up in the atmosphere. At 500 kilometers, uh, we are looking at uh, maybe six to seven years, plus uh, a few uncertainties either way. Uh, at 550 kilometers, we're looking at about 20 years, plus minus a few. And at 600 kilometers, we're looking at, you know, a much, much larger time frame. So anything uh, that is below 600 kilometers is subject to this kind of cleanup effect um, in sort of over shorter or longer time frames. Everything that is at 600 or above uh, only gets cleaned up very, very slowly. Now, just a, a quick uh, statistical overview. This, these are uh, ESA figures from, from earlier this year. Um, and they count uh, a total number of rocket launchers uh, since 1957 uh, of 6,380. These have placed more than 50,000 satellites into orbit. About 10,000 of them are still in space. The rest have deorbited or, or broken up. Um, and of those 10,000 in orbit, about 7,700 7, are still functioning. Uh, space surveillance tr networks track about 33,500 debris objects that are those with about 10 centimeters or more along one axis. Uh, about 640 events have been recorded uh, where space objects have broken up or exploded or collided. And all of this amounts to uh, and, uh, to, to a weight of 10,800 tons uh, of space, of man-made space objects. Now there are estimates um, beyond what is tracked by space surveillance networks. Um, so there are a few thousand space debris objects greater than 10 centimeters that are not tracked, giving us a total estimate of 36,000 in the range between one centimeter and 10 centimeters uh, is an estimate about a million debris objects, and in the millimeter range, we're looking at 130 million debris objects. Now, as I said earlier, um, this, is, this is just a snapshot. And as I said earlier, we are seeing a more intensive use of space. We are seeing more launches, and we'll see more launches in the future. Uh, we are seeing a trend towards more space objects, and we are seeing a trend towards more debris. Now let's go through these uh, in turn. So the first is um, more launches. The black bar uh, here shows the number uh, of launches per year along the left-hand uh, y-axis. So these have grown slowly over time from about an average of 60 to, to 80. Um, and since 2018, we've seen a more substantial jump into the range of 100 to 140. That's still not a huge progression, uh, but it is expected to grow by a larger frequency in the upcoming years. The growth in the blue figure is much more obvious. These are the numbers of launched satellites per year. These were measured along the right-hand y-axis. These were sort of below 200 for most years up until about 2016. And since then, we've seen a veritable explosion. 2021 was above 1600. So we see more stars and we see more satellites that are being put on each uh, rocket launch because sort of two things come Two, two, two trends come together here. The first is the miniaturization of satellites. 
uh, over the past decade, we've seen the emergence of, of smaller satellite concepts uh, sort of emerging like CubeSats or NanoSats, uh, which are much smaller than, than older generation satellites, which tended to have sort of the size of a washing machine or even a small car. Uh, so the miniaturization is one thing. The other is uh, the emergence of constellations, swarms of satellites to, to, in, to induce redundancies. You will have noticed these if you're looking at the night sky and see sort of this trail of about a dozen uh, satellites following the same orbit. Um, these are typically starling um, constellations. Um, so if, if they lose a satellite due to a malfunction, it's not a big deal because the others can sort of cover for it and 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 add their bad bandwidth to the overall uh, constellation. This brings us to the second trend, more objects. Here are, um, again, ISA statistics for the number of new payloads um, into low Earth orbit. Um, so this is not a total uh, number. So this is what gets added to LEO every year. Uh, it, it's important to note to, to note that um, this we, we see a clear trend here, but this does not apply to geo. Uh, the number of new objects in the geostationary orbit rarely rarely uh, exceeds like thirty or thirty five a year, and we don't see any growth uh, there since, since the nineteen eighties. So this this growth growth is sort of contained to Leo. So what we see here is sort of a massive growth first in twenty thirteen. Uh, again in 2017, and then since uh, since 2020. And sort of by the, the colored sections of the bars, you see that most of the growth is due to uh, commercial actors, in particular Starlink. Um, as of now, Starlink has something like 4,000, or probably by now more than 4,000 satellites in orbit, and it's currently planning about a total of about 12,000. Um, but again, more is in the works. I did give you this figure of about a million and Starlink uh, and, and other commercial actors will be responsible for like 99% of those. We also see a certain growth of, of civil um, uh, uh, civil satellites. We can't really extract that from this particular figure, but there is a growth of you know satellites being launched by you know universities or uh, associations or even private uh, persons or hobbyists. Now, as I said, the number of Planned launches or number of planned payloads in the future are gigantic. Um, as I said uh, just a minute ago, we have about 7,700 functioning satellites in orbit right now. And this number is scheduled to increase by several factors, by, by fivefold, tenfold um, over the coming decade. The third trend is more debris. Again, here's some, some ESA data from their environmental, sort of a space environmental report, which is very, um, uh, very handy and updated every year. Now, um, these are broken down by types. So they, they might sort of be uh, uh, due to, to rockets or payloads. Um, most of these are inactive uh, satellites. Um, this is the sort of the dark blue payload uh, part of the bar or a payload fragmentation debris. So a satellite uh, breaking apart or rocket fragmentation debris. These are also uh, some of the most uh, impactful forms of debris plus sort of the unidentified ones where we're not exactly sure uh, where they come from. Now, how, does, how, how do we even get debris? It might be because uh, old satellites stop working, um, because they run out of fuel, or because there's electrical problems or some kind of mechanical damage. Um, you can't reach the satellite anymore and suddenly have another debris object. Now, they may be the byproduct of starts. Rocket bodies uh, used to be such a big factor in, in creating debris. As I said, we're moving towards a future where these rocket parts are becoming more reusable. So let's hope that not we don't see an addition of further rocket bodies to this count. Then you might have collisions uh, with existing debris or with other satellites. 
um, you can see a few years where the number of, of the brief fragments jumps um, quite harshly, one in 2007, one in 2009. The 2009 jump is due to a collision between two satellites, an Iridium satellite and a Cosmos satellite in February 2009, which created about 2,000 debris fragments uh, at an altitude of 800 kilometers, so far outside the range where we would see uh, a cleanup effect. The other big source uh, here, and this is responsible for the 2000, 2007 uh, jump, and also for another one in, in uh, 2019 and 2021, are anti-satellite weapon tests. In 2007, the Chinese military tested uh, an anti-satellite weapon by blowing up a, a Chinese satellite, uh, at an, again, at an altitude of about 800 kilometers, uh, creating something like 3,000 debris fragments most of which are still still up there. There were further tests by India in 2019 and by Russia in 2021. These were at lower altitudes, um, somewhere between 250 and 400 kilometers. Um, there are still fragments from these tests around because some of them have been, uh, were sort of vaulted into higher altitudes through the, through the collision. Um, uh, but due to the lower altitude, um, most of the fragments there have thankfully decayed. There is growing international condemnation of these kinds of debris creating anti-satellite weapons tests. So let's hope that these were the last ones, but you know, I'm not, can't be sure uh, about these. Okay. So I said, we, we will see more space activity in the future. Uh, more launches, more objects, more debris. Now the risk that arises there from uh, are sort of the cascade effects of collision. So one collision creates debris objects, which then initiate another collision with another space object, creating even more fragments, which create even more collisions. The end result, if such a collision cascade were to take off, would be to make specific orbital bands, specific altitudes, permanently unusable, because there are simply too many fragments flying around there for the safe operation uh, of a space object. And sort of the, the pop culture reference here is, in, is the movie Gravity from 2013, where there's a major, uh, a central element of the plot. Uh, but among scientists, this is known as, as the Kessler syndrome after Donald Kessler, um, who was sort of the first to describe um, this, this possibility in a 1978 paper. I want to, to point the highlight this the, the year of publication. This is a problem that has been known for 45 years now, and we have seen very little action to counteract it. I, th I think that's that's really a failing. Okay, so it's it's impossible slash uh, next to impossible to estimate how and when such cascades will occur. Uh, we can just say at a very very simple level, um, the more objects you have in a particular orbital band, the higher the risk that such a cascade will at some point emerge. Emerge. We can't. We can't make any firm predictions about when and where uh, the carrying capacity of an orbit will be exceeded. Um, this is, you know, a sort of a space of considerable uncertainty. Um, if we had a better understanding, or if we were able to track smaller debris fragments, uh, we might be able to to formulate models which approximate this with more certainty. But as of now, we don't. Okay, so sort of an in interim conclusion here, we are putting more satellites uh, into low Earth orbit and massively accelerating frequency. It's unclear how many satellites orbits can carry without the risk exceeding the, our level of tolerance. The sort of set of rules and guidelines for the, the launch and the operation of satellites are very thin. And from this, from these sort of elements, I conclude that this, well, this won't work forever. At some point, 
uh, things are going to go bad. So my proposal or my, my sort of next step would be to argue that we need two things for a more sustainable use of the orbit and in particular low Earth orbit. We need to remove um, existing debris and we need to avoid creating further debris, first of all. Second of all, we need sort of rules of the road to um, use orbital bands safely, uh, efficiently and sustainably. Right, so what we're looking at here are sort of huge technical challenges, but these are also economic, legal and political challenges. And, and this is why I as a political scientist became interested in them. So this needs kind of sort of an interdisciplinary way of, of thinking about the problem, an interdisciplinary approach to governing it. Now let's introduce a few terms here. First of all, debris removal. Um, how do we get rid of the of the crap that's already up there? The first would be deorbiting. Um, this is sort of an emerging global standard, how to deal with satellites um, after end of mission. Um, again, there are ISA figures uh, collected over the years, um, how well this, uh, how, sort of how, how good the compliance with this emerging norm is. Uh, and it it says about 80% 80, 80 of rocket bodies are, are deorbited after use. So you use a, a rocket body to put the payload up into, uh, into the orbit and 80% uh, of these rockets are then uh, deorbited, uh, sort of put back into the atmosphere where they burn up or sort of crash into the oceans or something like that, which has an environmental impact itself, but you no, know, we're not going to talk about this today. 10 years ago, the figure was only 40%. So 80% today, 40% 10 years ago, that's some improvement. For satellites, uh, we are looking at a deorbiting rate of about 50%. So every other satellite is actively deorbited. So basically they use the last drop of, of fuel um, to put it sort of in a downward trajectory closer to Earth uh, where it will event eventually enter gravitational pull, slow down by the atmosphere and then burn up in the upper atmosphere. 10 years ago, the figure for satellites was less than 20%. So 20% 10 years ago, 50% today, again, some improvement, but you know, not total compliance because this isn't good enough. Uh, we have to say ISA says we need a removal rate at the orbiting rate of about 90% or at least 90% to prevent the growth rate of space objects uh, from, from spiraling out of control. So from, from uh, unsustainable growth. So this is one thing, getting rid of what's, of what's there um, by sort of making space objects come back into the atmosphere where they can burn up. Now, the orbiting works for, for objects where you still have some measure of control. You can tell a functioning satellite, okay, decrease your altitude to 300 kilometers um, so that you can eventually burn up. The problem is that this, of course, does not work with non-functioning space objects. Um, so non-functioning satellites or debris fragments, you can't, you can't order them around. Now, how do, you, how do you get rid of those? You need, for that, you need active debris removal. You need to put something up there that collects the trash uh, and, and either, puts it into the, uh, into the uh, atmosphere to burn up or return it to Earth in some fashion. Now, this is a very tricky engineering challenge and we are very far from a system that can be used at scale. The past five years or so have, been, have seen a lot of attention uh, to ADR and, and many proposals and pilot projects have been, uh, have been sort of put into practice there. And some of them have worked, some haven't, um, but we are really not seeing any kind of active debris removal at scale. It's really not around the horizon uh, at the moment. The problem, of course, is that you know this is expensive. This costs money. Who is supposed to pay for all this stuff? Uh, can you even pick up debris that is not sort of owned by your nation? There are loads of unresolved questions there. So active debris removal can only ever be a part of a 
sustainable management of the orbits, it, I would not bet on, you know, uh, uh, it becoming sort of this large scale solution to the overall problem. The other part of the solution besides debris removal is debris mitigation. So basically preventing new orbital, orbital debris uh, from being created. And this is sort of the more important lever we have over the long term. Currently, the 2007 UN Space Degree Mitigation Guidelines are sort of the, the, the global consensus on how this should be done. And the, its main, uh, uh, its main um, thrust is to um, uh, is to uh, ask satellite operators to deorbit um, their assets at end of life or end of mission, uh, or put them in a graveyard orbit from geosynchronous orbit. Uh, further out where they can, can't interfere uh, with future operations. Uh, and this includes a few other measures as well, such as passivization, uh, which means to um, make sure that the satellite is, uh, has, has no further energy stored in its battery or no further fuel uh, to prevent, you know, sort of unscheduled um, explosions or breakup events. Uh, it also mandates collision avoidance and, and you know, basically doing everything you can to avoid the creation of further objects. Now, these are um, smart proposals, but they're non-binding. Um, they need to be implemented in, in national space laws and regulations. And they're also quite short, so this is not a comprehensive rule book. We do see some more recent movement in debris mitigation. Um, for instance, the World Economic Forum put together an industry consortium, which includes several famous names, but notably not the very big ones like SpaceX or Amazon. Um, but they suggest um, sort of shortening the, the, the time frame in which uh, satellites have to be disposed of post end of mission from 25 years to five years, which is also the sort of where the, the FCC is going, the Federal Communications Commission in the United States, States which oversees um, basically all US space flights. ESA um, has put out the zero, uh, zero debris charter involving several EU aerospace companies like Thales or B Airbus, where they commit to you know, a more sustainable uh, uh, way of, of space flight. Now there's one third thing that it doesn't quite uh, fit into either of these categories, which is on-orbit servicing, uh, which is also sort of an emergent idea uh, that basically asks, well, how how about if we extend the um, the mission period for existing assets by sort of refueling them? Um, this is not a magic bullet. Uh, it will be very difficult to do that. It will be even more difficult to do that at scale and also you know, how valuable is it to, to sort of refuel a 10 year old satellite uh, with sort of 10 year old, uh, 10 year old instruments, you're probably better off deorbiting it and putting a new one up in space. Okay, now how do we, uh, how do we get this to work better? So everywhere where there's traffic, we have traffic rules or rules of the road, we have these uh, on, on the roads, we have these in the water, we have these in airspace, but we don't seem to have these in outer space. Now the problem, or one of the problems is that we're not exactly sure what's happening up there. So space situational awareness is a, a huge technical challenge because we have a hard time sort of continuously monitoring particular uh, orbits. And also there are different systems for doing that and every country is sort of running their own. Secondly, we are lacking rules for collision avoidance. Uh, what happens is that one of these space situational awareness systems or space surveillance networks will pick up a potential collision between two space objects and will give sort of a, 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 possible, a probability that this will happen, something like one in a thousand or one in 500, that a collision will happen at point X in the future. And this can be estimated maybe about a week or two in advance with considerable uncertainty. Um, and as the, as the potential collision date grows closer, you can uh, improve the probability or um, improve your, your, the precision uh, of the estimate. 
But what happens? What happens then? Um, there are there is no established international protocol or no protocol among space operators um, what to do then or even how to communicate in these uh, in these circumstances. Um, on the right here, we have a bunch of uh, uh, bars again from the ESA space environment report uh, looking at different orbits and what sort of the reasons or, or what what the what the occasion for um, collision avoidance maneuvers were. So in lower orbits, this is the, the leftmost bars, 350 kilometers. Most of them will be because of constellations or small satellites, which are the dark gray uh, parts of the bar. At 500 kilometers, the picture is much more mixed. Uh, 550, uh, mostly uh, smaller satellites again. But once we move to 700, 800 kilometers, most of the um, collision warnings will be due to debris, which are the blue kind, uh, the blue parts of the bar. Now, not every warning will need an avoidance maneuvers, but a growing number of these will require uh, will require this. And we're still at at a uh, at a period where collision where avoidance maneuvers are rare. Uh, I think the ISS does something like one or two every year. Um, so that's that doesn't seem like a lot. It's probably going to grow. Now, in in sort of the best possible future, we could um, automate these uh, avoidance maneuvers at least partly, because if you have some some kind of shared network estimating uh, a collision probability that is below the risk threshold, uh, then you could sort of algorithmically decide the optimum avoidance maneuver and implement these. Uh, uh, with or without a human in input, but you know we're still a few steps uh, away from that because right now we don't have a set of rules for that, and this is sort of the the political science question here: where do these rules come from? Now, international inter the international space law basically consists of only five treaties, so there's not a lot there. Um, the Outer Space Treaty, the Rescue Agreement, the Space Liability Convention, and the Res Registration Convention. There's also the Moon Treaty, but that's not enforced because too few countries have ratified this. So all in all, this is a very thin institutional framework uh, for, for space governance and was also made for a very different time, uh, especially a time before we have large private uh, companies engaging in, in space activities. Now, legal scholars sometimes tell me that you can sort of apply uh, bodies of rules from other kind, other fields of international law, such as international environmental law, to space. Um, but this doesn't seem to, be, seem to be happening in practice. So I would like to see some more of that. So I'm guessing we are better off looking for stronger international standards and soft law. And the, the aforementioned space debris mitigation guideline might be a good example of that. They started back in 1994 and 95 in the scientific and technical subcommittee of the UN committee of the peaceful users of outer, for the peaceful users, users of outer space, which sort of developed the first work plan in this direction. Uh, it put out a technical report in 1999. In 2003, the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, which is sort of a joint forum of, of different space agencies, I put out a set of proposals which sort of represented the consensus among spacefaring nations, uh, which were then fed into another UN COP4 subcommittee, and, and this sort of developed uh, the, the space debris mitigation guidelines largely out of the IADC proposals, which were also later endorsed by the UN General Assembly. Now, the thing is, this project, uh, this process took 13 years, and it only led to an output of non-binding guidelines. But uh, on the plus side, these are widely accepted and they sort of represented the best possible consensus at the time. So maybe this is the best we can get in terms of shared rules. Uh, there are also sort of norms and practices beyond the level uh, or beneath the level of, of formalized standards, uh, such as the non-binding or voluntary uh, uh, commitment against uh, debris-creating um, anti-satellite weapon tests, which 
Germany, among other countries, has agreed to. And we also see that um, companies sometimes uh, publicly agree to conform to sustainability standards, you know, without being forced to. Now, when we are looking at debris mitigation and space traffic management, we often hear that we need new institutions or that we need no, new organizations or a, or a reinterpretation of old institutions. And I'm, I'm not really optimistic that we're going to get that uh, in the current climate of world politics. These kinds of global cooperation achievements seem to be out of reach. Um, we have a degree of great power a conflict that we haven't had for a few decades now. Now, we did have that during the Cold War when most of these uh, institutions were created, but for reasons I can't really go into now, the situation today is less amenable uh, to, to sort of big treaty making. But I think there's more to be gained in, in the, the less formalized areas of, of governance and international standards and soft law and in shared norms. And practices. So we shouldn't look for sort of the, the big uh, uh, the big fundamental reform that creates this new updated system of, of space governance, but more incremental improvements within uh, the existing framework. That seems to be more realistic. And for that, I think we need to look to polycentric uh, governance. This is based on, on Eleanor Ostrom's uh, theory of the governance of the commons, um, which is come from political economy, um, the, the tragedy of the commons, um, where sort of economists always say, well, if, if you have a commons, it will be overused and this can only be prevented by either privatizing the commons or by putting it under some kind of uh, central, uh, central government. And Ostrom and her colleagues uh, argue that this kind of tragedy only really applies in unregulated commons, but effective management is possible through cooperative institutions. And this is the notion of polycentricity in governance. It is um, based on polycentric systems, which are networks of independent nodes, um, uh, all of which have some kind of degree of uh, decision-making power, but they that, that need to coordinate with other nodes. And governance is sort of the byproduct of sort of what happens uh, when when uh, when these nodes start interact interacting, um, notably, this does not imply that these nodes are all sort of uh, are all the same. Um, uh, there are some there's some degree of hierarchy and polycentricity as well. Now, I'm not going to discuss this in any great uh, theoretical detail, uh, except to make the point that space governance. Uh, is not polycentric so far, but I think this would be useful because polycentric governance can use the distributed knowledge, it can mobilize stakeholders, and it seems to be more politically possible than you know this big institutional reforms that, that other people want to look at. Now, more specifically, how might this look like? Here are a few proposals. The first would be to develop shared situational uh, awareness among different actors. Right now, every actor, every country basically runs their own uh, uh, space situational awareness system. They share some of the data, not all of it. So sort of agreeing on what's happening is already kind of difficult. Um, this would also include space weather. So and it, tying this into sort of space research uh, and, and cooperating on space research uh, uh, would be very useful for that. And, and this also involves sharing data. Um, there is some data sharing going on, but there is a certain degree of secrecy, um, especially when it comes to things like, you know, military assets in space that prevents sort of sharing the full set uh, of, of uh, data on, on space objects. We might also think about you know, strengthening existing governance mechanisms. And for that, I would like to see strengthening of the registration system. Uh, we do have an existing convention that says all space objects should be registered with the UN, but this often happens um, only belatedly or not at all, again, with military assets often. 
so many actors are sort of running their own semi uh complete uh, registration systems but you know a shared system would be a really great asset for everyone to work with now i would like to see protocols for data exchange so just agreeing on the let's say data formats how data about space debris can be exchanged you know offering apis for for accessing each other's data sets uh, agreeing on you know what what are risk estimates that we want to work with um these would be super useful and this would also entail you know coming up with procedures for collision avoidance i'm reminded of an anecdote i, I heard not too long ago when i was talking to um, someone who had been working at a, a European satellite operator um, for a long time. And he recalled about a decade ago, so maybe 2013 or so, um, when one of their satellites had sort of been, uh, they, they had been cooperate, cooperating with NASA on something and they had been added to the NASA collision avoidance systems without really realizing it. And suddenly uh, an email popped in that said, uh, look, there's a, there's a, there's a potential collision coming up for this particular asset, uh, which which you are operating. And everyone was really confused and overwhelmed uh, what to do about this because they did not have standards. They did not have procedures for how to do it. And then they spent a long time sort of calculating uh, the kind of avoidance maneuver that's necessary and then doing that. And, that and they later spoke to NASA uh, their counterpart there informed the world this was actually only a warning. This, this was not an implication that you would actually need to avoid it. Um, so this kind of communication mishap uh, was kind of, was quite you know normal ten years ago, even five years ago. There was this anecdote in 2019 where an I think an ESA satellite was uh, set to to have a a collision uh, with a Starlink satellite. Uh, and back then, you know, everything was sort of conducted via by, via bilateral email. So the the ESA operators uh, sent an email to Starlink saying, "Hey, look, we are due a collision. Um, how how do you want to do the the avoidance?" And nobody responded from there because uh, Starlink wasn't really set up for that at the mo at that time. So ESA had to to conduct uh, the um, the avoidance maneuver unilaterally. Now things have evolved quite a bit since then. Um, since 2021, Starlink and ESA and Starlink and other operators have sort of an informal protocol for collision avoidance, where Starlink has sort of said in a blanket statement, our satellites will avoid if a collision of risk X uh, is detected. So this is a very simple protocol. It's also very straightforward. The problem is how can you how can you scale that up? So what happens if in cases of you know Starlink a Starlink satellite meeting a satellite from an operator that Starlink does not have an agreement with, or if we have an ESA and a JAXA satellite, can can they find some kind of procedure? So it, it feels like there's a there's a procedure there that only needs to be you know put into words or put into practice, uh, and, and you know a bunch of criteria that we need to work out how such uh, avoidance uh, can be done um, efficiently because we're going to need that more in the future. Now, these points so far, I think all um, will all could all be implemented simply due to the added value that they promise. It will they will make space safer for everyone. They require minimal investment. Um, so I'm thinking it, it should be easy should be easy to to get satellite operators space agencies to sign up for for ideas along these lines now it will be more difficult when it comes to space debris uh, because this is about costs and how to distribute these costs and, and share them so um stronger commitment to debris mitigation it would be wonderful but how do we get states to commit to that when they see it as you know just you know some cost that inhibits the growth of their domestic space economy um, should will we see a race to the top here or a race to the bottom? How do we create incentives for debris removal? I mentioned active debris removal is quite pricey. Uh, who will bear the costs of these? So this is less easy to answer from a polycentric perspective. 
I would suggest we try to strengthen anti-debris norms. We try to create sort of an environmental consciousness, which I'm trying to do here, incidentally, um, that we create an opening for an independent situational awareness um, in space to, to be able to name and shame rule breakers, um, that we need to encourage participation and deliberation um, from all stakeholders, uh, operators, states, even civil society. And in the long term, we need to find ways of orbital recycling, but you know, a technical challenge, we're still very far away. All right. So when we started, I said that we need to move to, uh, it would be great if we could have this cultural shift in the way we see space and see it more as an environment and not just as this, this thing out there that doesn't concern us. And uh, I was looking for, you know, representations, how such a future might look like. And maybe this, this is an indication of the problem that I didn't really find any sort of positive vision of sustainable space, at least not in pop culture. So if we look at movies or, or books or games, um, they often problematize how we engage with space and how we treat it unsustainably. Uh, one example of Futurama, which sort of satirizes um, sort of the short-sightedness of, of humanity that where where that the, the point of, of this particular ed episode is that New York New New York just you know shoots its trash into space where it won't bother anyone anymore forever um, until of course the, the trash ball comes back to earth. But you know there are very few positive examples for for environmental protection in space. Um, here's a Korean, South Korean movie from 2021 that engages with the topic, but it's also another dystopia where Earth has become uninhab uninhabitable, where orbital debris is being harvested to, to recycle uh, raw materials from that. So I would like to have a more accessible utopia, a more iconic vision of a sustainable uh, way of managing the orbits. And if you come up with anything, Please contact me. I would love to hear from you. Um, thanks for listening. I hope this uh, this was interesting and useful to you uh, and helps you think about um, space uh, in more sustainable terms. Thank you.